All right. On today's episode of the Narrative Monopoly podcast, we have our second return guest after Martin Gurry, and that is John Cochran. John, I gave his whole bio in the first one, and I highly encourage everyone to go listen to the first one because we're more or less going to pick up where that left off. But I will say that one comment I got, this is not the John Cochran who is the Surgeon General of the Continental Army and later the, the personal doctor for George Washington, known as Good Dr. Bones. This is the John Cochran of the Grumpy Economist blog, which was the one thing I left out in the first intro, and you you got on me because that's perhaps the most important. How are you, John? Well, I wouldn't think it's the most important, but it's the one of most interest to uh, most viewers and least equations of all the things I do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, hey, it's a, it's a great blog. There's a lot that's on there that we're going to cover today. But let's jump into what I think everyone wants to hear about right at first, which is, you know, you said in July when we last spoke, I've been ringing the alarm bells for 20 years that there will be inflation. Now there's inflation. What's going on? There's inflation. I, I do feel a little guilty. I'm kind of the guy who's been carrying around that signpost saying the world's about to end for 20 years now. And so I don't think I get to say I called it. Larry Summers gets to say he called it. He, he changed his mind from uh, secular stagnation forever to watch out there's inflation, which I think is uh, a remarkable turnaround. Um, no, what happened? Um, Milton Friedman once said that if you drop money from helicopters, you get inflation. And that's pretty much what they did. Uh, the um, During the uh, uh, pandemic, the uh, major thing our government did was to literally print up somewhere between two and three trillion dollars and send it to people as checks. Uh, they borrowed another two to three trillion dollars and sent that to people as more checks. <laughs> uh, and um, we'll get into the weeds about why this did and why this time, not other times, but send like five trillion dollars to people as checks. You should not be surprised when about a year later prices start going up. So in my view, it's really simple, uh, basically helicopter money. Um, now, uh, they will say, oh, what supply shocks? Yeah, the supply capacity of our economy is limited. It always was limited. Uh, and there's lots of regulations and sort of so shorty ending of COVID and so forth that's making supply capacity less limited. But um, supply meets demand. <laughs> And demand meets supply. And if people weren't trying to buy stuff like crazy, then the ports wouldn't be backed up trying to unload containers like crazy. So ultimately, it comes from you know too much demand, not enough supply. So I think that story's the basic story is uh, very simple. Um, the story of the Fed not even recognizing this, the most what's the Fed supposed to do, but calibrate the supply capacity of the economy and set demand where it ought to be, and they completely, completely missed this one. It's a story of grand institutional failure. I mean, failure. I mean this is like Pearl Harbor, and you're asleep when the Japanese planes are coming in. Now, underestimating demand, that was their, their grave sin? Uh, okay. um, not realizing that if you print up $5 trillion and send it to people, you're likely to get some inflation, and not realizing that the supply capacity of the economy was lower than they thought. They, they don't really pay much attention to supply. It's really interesting. The, the central banks seem to think it's always demand and that supply is way out there somewhere. And to the extent they think about supply, they think about uh, concepts in the labor market, the non-inflationary unemployment rates. So they sort of look at unemployment rates. But the, even though they have thousands of PhD economists out there thinking about what to do, Nobody's watching how many containers can you get off a boat in LA <laughs> and, and thinking about what is the supply capacity of the economy. And they're, they're still stimulating. They're, they're still out there to this moment saying the economy needs support. The interest rates are still zero. They're still buying bonds. Um, they, they, they really got stuck in fighting yesterday's war against deflation and uh, haven't realized that, well, that's not where we're at anymore. 
Well, I want to get into the politics of it, but I, I was speaking with someone who runs a logistics company who is kind of in the thick of everything that's going on with the the ports um, not being able to get their you know supplies in. And what he said was, it's pretty simple. There has to be a demand side recession in order <laughs> for everything to shake out. Is that true? Um, <clears throat> now, inflation is everything going up at the same time. It's There's this uh, big mistake to think about inflation as well. There's the supply at the ports and then the supply here and then the supply so forth. That's relative prices. Um, what could be going, you know, what would go on normally is you can't get stuff through the ports. So those prices go up, but other prices go down. Um, so you don't cure inflation by individually uh, picking on things like that. The overall supply supply to the economy is limited and the demand is too much because we printed up money and handed it out. That's where inflation is coming from. And the ports are a, a those are a great symbol of American dysfunction because, um, you know, China's ports are working fine. They're, they're putting stuff on the boats, no problem. <laughs> uh, but uh, when you look at the ports, there's a whole waft of regulations. One of the problems is that they got empty containers uh, sitting around and they're clogging up the works. But the zoning laws in LA don't allow you to stack containers more than too high. So there's empty containers in the way. And there's uh, environmental laws saying you're not allowed to idle trucks for too long. So you can't, the trucks aren't around when you need them. And, and of course, it's very hard to hire. The ultimate supply problem right now is a labor shortage. And uh, you know, hilariously, five years ago, we we're saying, oh, all the truck drivers will be unemployed from AI. We need universal basic income. Well, you can't hire a truck driver right now. So there's, it's very hard to hire people. Um, for all sorts of regulars. So well, we're, our, our supply side of the economy overall is <clears throat> lower than it should be for all sorts of legal and regulatory uh, things. And now that you need to clean up the ports and you need to clean up the labor markets and you need to clean up the zoning laws, and, uh, fixing supply is not a president comes down and decrees things. It's just, a, it's a, I call it the grand Murray condoing of our economy. Uh, you got to put the, the Hoover and Cato Institute in charge of microeconomics if you want to fix supply. Uh, and that would let us uh, meet some of this demand. But ultimately, when, when the demand comes from printing too much money, uh, the inflation is going to come. And uh, um, the, the, it's not about isolated stories of particular markets. That, that's a mistake that's commonly, we're, we're, we're going to just make all the mistakes from the 1970s. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, I, I'm old enough to remember the 70s. <laughs> and uh, what happened? There? Oh, this ener it's an energy shock. It's just a supply shock. Oh, it's transitory. Oh, it's this market or that market. Oh, the President Biden's already starting to yell at companies to not raise prices. It's exactly what Nixon did in 1972. Are they going to try wage price controls? Is that what's coming next? That's just kind of sad. Now, now what about the explanation that it's more so the, the money printing is not necessarily a, a miscalculation on the Fed's part, but it's more so a matter of real politic and the reality is if asset prices start going down, people start getting angry and they're really just trying to placate perhaps the, the most powerful people in the country. Is that, you know, it, it, that's, that's definitely more of a political explanation rather than a, a miscalculation. Perhaps the models came after the, the political decision of there can't be a crash in the market. We have to keep propping it up. I mean, this is more of a meme, if anything, but <laughs> I think it's the wrong meme. I do think the Fed has gotten very politicized because it has to. Jay Powell is just a master at, at figuring out the fine lines of, of where he has to go to, to keep his job. Uh, but I, I think right now, the direction the Fed is politicized is in the direction of, of labor markets, not in the direction of asset markets. Uh, I think they'd be, they, they, they don't like stock prices going down. Uh, as long as it's in good times, they, they, they prop up prices if there's a recession going on. But I think they would uh, let stock prices go down. What they, you just read what they say. Um, you don't have to, there's nothing conspiratorial about this. Um, they, are, uh, uh, they, they say we're concerned about labor markets, equity and inclusive growth. And so this is like a 1965 view that we need to boost inflation in order to drive down unemployment. Somehow they think that more inflation 
more stimulus is going to, the, the problem in the labor market is not unemployment. There's 10 million job openings and 7 million unemployed. <laughs> Uh, the problem in the labor market is that a, a large number of people are not even looking for a job. Labor force participation is down. The Fed has, has decided that, that letting inflation run hot and keeping stimulating is, it's, is going to get people out of the woodwork to, to apply for a job who are not doing so right now for all sorts of mm, some interesting and some obscure reasons. Yeah, what are, uh, that, what are those reasons? So that's, that's the, if you want to think of the politics of it, I, I think the politics, especially with a half of the Fed coming up for renomination, a very progressive Democratic administration, uh, and, um, uh, and, and explicit goals for inclusive growth. You go to the regional Fed websites and they think they're going to cure racism. Uh, you know, that, that's, that's the politics of the Fed at the moment, plus climate. Sorry, you were going to ask a question. Yeah, the labor shortages. I mean, it's one of these things where it just it doesn't make sense, right? And so the 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 untrained eye, I'm sitting here wondering, and I think a lot of people are sitting here wondering why, what's going on, you know? The and the wages. When you talk about all of the openings, you know, you you can't pass a retail or you know uh, or hospitality business without seeing a sign. And it's like every two weeks, the, the the wage on the sign continues to increase, and yet they can't get people. What's going on? Why why can't we fill those jobs? Yeah, it's sad. We we went out to our favorite sushi place last night, which is still not not uh, serving in tables. And they, and there's a sign right there saying, "We'd love to start serving tables, but until we can get a cashier and three waiters, <laughs> we're, you know, you, you got to do your takeout." And, and the store next door said there was a sign saying "hiring" and a sign saying "closed" because <laughs> we're we're just done. Um. So uh, this is a hard one because I don't totally know the answer. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of things to point to. So there are a lot of disincentives to work right now. And those disincentives are getting bigger. There was for a long time over the summer, we, you know, the government was paying people not to work. Well, it's not a surprise that if you pay people so long as they don't work, they don't work. And the structure of our social programs is such that once you kind of get on the social program, if you earn a dollar, they take away a dollar of your benefits. So, and, and this is only getting worse and worse. The, the Build Back Better plan has just adds on to these kinds. Now that hasn't passed yet, so that doesn't, doesn't explain right now, but it, it, um, it, it piles on the disincentives. So uh, I, uh, it, I definitely think that's part of it. Uh, part of it is the same $5 trillion. Uh, there's, there's, there's kind of hope that if you gave, if you printed five trillion bucks and gave people checks, they put it in the bank account and then get back to work, and and we would have started our road to solving multi generational wealth accumulation or whatever the, the <laughs> words are. That you know, the fact is, so many Americans live hand to mouth. They got a hundred bucks of cash, and and it, and they're in just desperate situation if something bad happens. So. You might have hoped that you know a couple thousand bucks in the bank, and you don't have to pay your rent for a year, and that would get them going. But I think there's another possibility that you know people get a couple thousand bucks in the bank, and they just say, "Well, I'm you know, why should I work until I need to?" Uh, and um, that, that that's 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 pretty sad. But I think that's that's part of it as well. It's just so odd because there are so there are all these signs that I think in retrospect are going to be obvious where, you know, if you study the history on this stuff, everything seemed great, but then there were these, there were these weird incongruencies, like exactly what we're talking about, the labor shortage, the supply shortage, uh, inflation, where in hindsight, you know, of a recession is what I'm implying. It just, it seems obvious. And so, and it always, you know, it, it's like the, 2007, right? Everything seemed amazing until it came crashing down. So I guess, what do you make of this as a, you know, economist and, and also historian in your own right of these signs, you know, is this, is this kind of like the potion that that's brewing up a recession that you see in terms of like common signs or obviously they don't repeat, um, and I, I'm not saying you're going to, you know, predict a recession here, but is that there's something that just seems off, right? And I, I've, you know, you're someone that studied this stuff. There's a lot that seems off. Um, I wanted to add to our last one before before we get going to this one. Uh, so part of what's happening is retirements. So a lot of people, uh, when companies shut down, there was a lot of early retirements. So I, I know a bunch of airline pilots. 
who are roughly my age and a lot of them retired. Uh, and um, now the airlines need them back again, but of course they were kind of high on the scale. And so they're, they're still with the airlines. Are, and now the airlines are desperate for pilots. Well, getting people back out of retirement's hard. So that's the kind of example of sort of permanent transitions that come in. The other thing that's happened is of course, um, this economy, now, now on to sort of your theme, with COVID, there's been a big shift in, in the jobs. A, we call it reallocation in, in technical terms. So, you know, it's not like your old job is there calling, there's a new job. That's why, you know, we have 7 million unemployed and 10 million jobs. Why don't we just solve this problem tomorrow? Well, there are different jobs in different places than, than the unemployed. So um, there, there's, and shifting is hard. You, what you asked is a really big question. So, um, Hold on a minute. <laughs> really, it's the question of microeconomics versus macroeconomics. Do we need stimulus or do we need to clean up the bedroom already, the, the Marie Kondo approach? And I think what we're seeing is that there's just a tremendous amount of microeconomic sand in the gear. Every individual market you look at is, is screwed up. That, that needs a, a grand simplifying reform, which is not what's coming out of Washington right now. What's coming out of Washington is one more enormous boondoggle. And I do think uh, things falling apart at the seams. Now that's kind of that's kind of general conservatives feeling that things are falling apart at the seams. But I do think there is uh, there's some truth to that. Uh, the, just the stunning incompetence that we're seeing out of Washington is is uh, pretty sad. We just can't fix basic, simple problems. And but the only thing our government seems to know how to do about anything is to spray money on it. Uh, when you look at the actual structure of this infrastructure and build back better plans, it's just money sprayed willy nilly over everything, combined with just um, immense numbers of disincentives. I, I looked carefully, for example, at the child care. Uh, parts of the bill. They, they, these were put together by people who, we, we've been doing social programs since the 1930s. And have these guys not seen any experience with how to construct a social program so it's not full of uh, horrendous disincentives? I'll just start with one. Oh, child care is a, is, a, is a crisis, how expensive it is. So we're going to require that all child care employees are paid not 20 grand a year, but 50 grand a year. They have to be paid the same as as uh, as people with who teach in elementary schools. Well, that'll do wonders for the cost of childcare, now won't it? <laughs> so there's a, a tremendous incompetence. Um, in, you know, we're, we're building. Uh, we're we're going to throw money at supposed infrastructure. Only 100 billion is going to roads and bridges. Gee, what happened to the to the? Remember the 2009 stimulus with uh, you know shovel ready programs? We haven't done anything about the fact that it costs four billion dollars a mile to run, to build a subway in New York. The high speed train in California. We're now what 15 years into it. They have not laid a single mile of track. I think it will a, be it will be funny if Texas beats them to the punch. Yeah, well, it's a it's an insane idea, but given that it's the idea and funded and the and the and the pet project of the California governor and climate change, others can't get anything done. Uh, so that I think we are we we're falling apart at the seams in the details. It's not we focus on you know how much money they spent and so forth, but that's it's the details of what they're doing and and just the incompetence of the basics of governing. Um, you know, why is there a crisis at the southern border? Well, put it together, we've passed an asylum law. It says everyone has a right to asylum. And then there's a backlog in the courts. You know, it takes years and years to hear. Well, hire some more damn judges. We're going to spend a trillion dollars on infrastructure. It seems to me we could hire hundreds of judges and clear out that backlog. So, you know, our, 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 the infrastructure of government is, is pathetic. Uh, both in its competence and its size. Now, the other, now back to macro. So there's a micro problem, which is just this accumulated sand in the gears. Um, macro, where are we going? I think we're in danger of repeating many of the, uh, you know, you asked for a recession. And so what, what, uh, what the micro view says is, well, I don't know when we get a recession, a sharp up and down, but uh, the outlook for um, very slow growth, for supply constraints to be there for a long time. Well, until you get that hard Marie Kondo job of cleaning up the supply, 
uh, which you're going to get supply. And in the 70s, that's what it was there. So over-regulated economy. And Reagan came along and did a little bit of good on that. And look, the thing, the thing grew. So that's, uh, it's not going to start growing. Uh, the danger is this long, slow decay of, of, a, of a society and an economy that's just full of lawyers and red tape and, and suits and nothing can get done because you got to fill out the paperwork. And Mark Stein calls us the Republic of Paperwork, which, which I, I love. That's getting worse. Well, On macro, me- you, you asked for what I'm going to finally answer your question. So is a recession coming? I think we're in danger of repeating the boom bust cycle in the 70s. Uh, inflation is going to get out of control. Eventually, the Fed's going to wake up and say, boy, we got to do something about it. They're going to jack interest rates up. Then you get a recession. Uh, yeah, I don't know when, but that seems like the natural danger. Okay, now I'll shut up and let you ask me the question. <laughs> well, I was going to say the in terms of everything is just all of this red tape. W- would you say that the growth of the administrative state is an admission of a scaling failure of the Constitution? Yeah, so the growth, uh, I don't know if it's a scaling failure or if it's a failure to live by the Constitution, <laughs> certainly a failure of Congress to do its job. Um, and, and I'm now actually kind of nostalgic for the administrative state. Remember the good old days when there were uh, regulators who um, followed the Administrative Procedures Act and actually wrote rules and regulations, and those were subject to public comment periods and cost benefit analysis, and then were promulgated and discussed. Wow, the good old days of constitutional order compared to now where we just have executive orders and administrative fiat and and just that that we vote in a new king and he orders things to happen. Um, That's in some sense, that's worse. That's where we are that's worse than the administrative state. And that's part of the machinery of government uh, not not functioning anymore. Well, I think that one thing you touched on in the, the previous answer, I'm just going to, I don't know if there's an actual term for this. I'm going to deem it the the super macro. So even above like the, the present picture of the, the macro economy, the super macro over the last 20 to 30 years where you have had failure after failure after failure on the part of the federal government, mostly in terms of these big projects uh, across the world and domestically, you know, we go to Afghanistan, we fight these guys who basically are just goat herders and we fail after 20 years and however many trillions of dollars that we spent on it. And not only did we fail, but it collapsed within, I I think less than a month was the, the, the final total there. And, and now the Taliban is in charge of Afghanistan. And I believe they just did a military parade with all of the uh, actual equipment that we left behind. Um, and then you look at uh, other events that have happened, COVID, you know, the inability to uh, do anything effectively in terms of stopping or slowing the pandemic when this was something that, you know, the government was supposed to be on top of, right? I mean, there are there was money dedicated, resources dedicated to having it prepared. I mean, let's let's say this: like, why wouldn't you have a bank of five hundred million or a billion N95 masks just sitting there, so you can just mail them out to everyone? I mean, obviously, like that's you know maybe that won't work, or whatever. But we're talking a, a price point of probably like a couple maybe a couple billion dollars tops and you could have done that or at home testing kits. Um, It's just all of these things that seem very simple that you have the most powerful empire in the world is now on this 20 year, 30 year decline in, in, in real time and in front of everyone transparently where it is unable to control not just world events, but events that it wants to control. We are reaching out and we are saying we are going to influence these events and we are failing to do so. Uh, and beyond influencing events, there's just the basic governing competence. Uh, our elites are incompetent. Our, bureaucrat- our bureaucracies are incompetent. It's becoming more and more obvious, uh, you know, in, in in what I do, that the Federal Reserve didn't notice mortgages might blow up, and then they didn't notice there might be a pandemic, and now they didn't figure out there might be inflation. Uh, you pointed out military failures. Our military is actually pretty good at winning wars. 
but just disastrously incompetent at figuring out what to do next. And that's not really the military's fault. That's the foreign policy establishment, which um, since, since uh, uh, I guess Yugoslavia was a, uh, a draw, would, uh, you know, it wasn't a total disaster, but everything else after the army wins the actual war has, has been one disaster. And let's, you mentioned Afghanistan, how's things doing in, in Syria, Libya, uh, Egypt, uh, you know, everywhere where we set foot in our foreign policy. And, and it's a it's a disaster of basic competence of the ability to sort of make plans and 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 not try to get the poll of the day. I mean, just as a little one, why does president after president set a timeline for when we're going to withdraw from things? <laughs> right. I didn't say June, June 6, 1944. Well, boys, the boys are coming home by Christmas. And we encourage Hitler to put, to uh, return to talks to discuss the power sharing uh, process. No, you know, you're in there until we're done. <laughs> and you read out of Afghanistan every time a president, who, why, why do they do it? Because they want the jump in the polls now for ending the war before the war is actually over. And, and what happened? The, the local guys say, well, yeah, you've been real helpful to us, but your president just announced that you're leaving in six months. And so, you know, we'll do what we want. Uh, COVID is a great example. COVID is not, people focus on the president and, and poor Anthony Fauci and so forth, but uh, just the machinery of the bureaucracy uh, revealed itself as stunningly incompetent, even if it's basic jobs and not at what it needed was a change in mind. You're, you're fighting exponential growth and you got to get the reproduction rate below one. And it could not, you know, that every day counts. And it's what's really interesting about COVID is how it's gotten worse. A year ago, the discussions around COVID, at least sort of the policy, you know, in the chattering classes where I live, was a remarkably sophisticated discussion. People understood the SIR model then, and that the point, there's no point in doing anything unless you get the reproduction rate below one and, and sort of nuanced, well, could we lock down this versus lock down that? Uh, super spreader events is a, a, a good, didn't get anywhere because the, as you mentioned, the CDC, made it illegal for even people to make their own tests. Stanford's labs were not allowed to test, even though they knew how to do it. Made it illegal for people to import masks that didn't have a US stamp on it because they were only made to U European Union rules. Made it Ill uh, the FDA would not allow people to sell tests. Just goes on and on, but it's gotten worse. <laughs> this time around, Delta comes, where is, uh, you know, oh, we have the test. We could put in place a testing procedure. No, we're just going to have rules, but you have to put your mask over your mouth. or just have to go, but, you know, the, the one thing we're talking about is ever varying masks. You know, masks may, might reduce transmission rates 5 10%, might get the reproduction rate from 6 to if 5 If they're N95s too. The craziest yeah. thing is all these surgical masks that do nothing. But, but there, it's not going to get the reproduction rate below one. So uh, so we're it's just empty. So that's a great example of uh, of incompetence that got worse uh, uh, over time. Um, so that is the the big in in field after field. The elites have shown that they don't know what they're doing, and the bureaucracies have shown them to self to be just the basics of government. Now, Biden was supposed to come in and fix that. He was supposed to be the centrist who brought back normality and, and who brought competence and you know people who knew what they were doing to government. And it's just gone entirely in the, uh, in the uh, opposite direction, which is sad. And we don't even have to start about climate <laughs> where, uh, where our elites seem to have gone completely off the rails. Well, I, I, yeah, I do. I do think at this point, a lot of the climate change stuff, I mean, I think you and I are both in agreement that the climate is changing the science is obvious, all that stuff, but it's also true that there is no coming apocalypse. And there's a lot of people that have done great work to, to show this and all of these kind of arbitrarily restrictionist policies that are now coming out of every single branch and every single corner of the government. I mean, I, I think it's, it's pretty clearly a Trojan horse. It's, we're going to say that, you know, the, if, these models that, by the way, uh, you know, they benefit what we want to say, you know, they're going to say that all of a sudden, like the, you know, the, the cities are going to be flooded and there's going to be all this damage and, you know, there's an extinction event, all of these just, just crazy things that has just proven not to happen. I mean, even in terms of like human deaths, they're, you know, in human deaths are down 95% from weather related events over the last hundred years. There are more trees in North America today than 
I'm pretty sure there, there ever has been or something like that. It's pretty yeah, close. It's actually a problem. We're having fires because we suppressed fires <laughs> and, and grew way more trees. <laughs> but go ahead. Yes. Yeah, way more trees. Um, a, another thing, you know, the, the, the carbon emissions for the United States are at a 30 year low right now. And yes, the actual. Thanks, thanks, by the way, to fracking, which produced natural gas and was yes. violently resisted by uh, every part of the federal government who's supposed to be in charge of lowering emissions. That's why we lowered emissions. Yeah. And it's, it's you know, and even like you look at the Department of Energy and their forecasts have us at, uh, I think, 11 percent of global emissions by 2050. And so th th this is how you know that it is a Trojan horse for more government control, because simply put, if you were to tackle a problem. And which was carbon emissions. What and you and I was to tell you that 89% in group A we're we're gonna call it, we're gonna be we're gonna account for 89%, and then group B, the United States, would be eleven percent. Which one would you start to work on? You would start to work on 89%, obviously. And then the other piece of it that is that is exactly what you talked about is fracking and natural gas uh, emit way way lower amounts of carbon than just crude oil and or coal. And, uh, and, and then obviously the, 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 you know, the, the big kind of, uh, elephant in the room here is nuclear nuclear emits zero carbon and they don't want to use nuclear. They don't want to use natural gas. They want to use wind, which is just, it's, it's not efficient. The wind is not always blowing or solar when we have these solutions. And so when these people tell me that I have to make all of these sacrifices and that we have to do all of these things in our private lives and, and with our businesses, when they are not willing to attack the vast majority, 89% of the problem, or entertain these solutions like nuclear and, and quite frankly, are just hostile towards the other ones like Nat Gas, I'm just not going to take you seriously. I think it's a Trojan horse. What do you think? Well, it's, it's a, it is a, uh, it has turned from a technocratic um, uh, movement, uh, which, um, where, yes, where you can admit, hey, nuclear has its pluses and minuses, but it emits zero uh, um, carbon. And maybe we should discuss why the Nuclear Regulatory Commission won't allow anyone to build nuclear plants in the US. Um, carbon capture and storage, you're not allowed to talk about. Why? Because that would let you burn carbon during the, during the uh, transmission, during the transition. And you know, if really you think that the Earth is on a tipping point and that higher temperatures are going to end life on Earth, maybe we should be talking about releasing some sulfur dioxides into the upper atmosphere that would very cheaply cool the Earth. Now, I don't necessarily think it's a good idea. I don't, you know, know the pluses and minuses, but these are you're not allowed to talk about it. I think what you've noticed is that this in the 1990s, this was a sort of technocratic scientific thing where we could talk about it. Now it has become a moral, almost religious and, and highly partisan political cause. I mean, I think uh, really Al, Al Gore gets a lot of the blame from taking some, there was lots of Republicans on, on the climb. You know, we had done ozone successfully as, as George Schultz used to point out, but then this became a test of moral um, courage. And then, and then it gets wrapped up with, well, it's immoral. You, you have, there's a, we, we are in the middle of, of the great awakening and there are lots of people who feel very guilty and want to do something about the guilt and sin of their lives. And burning carbon is sinful. So um, it really gets wrapped. And it gets wrapped up into how capitalism is sinful. Even the IPCC reports, are, you know, are, they go on into about how, well, in order to talk about climate, we have to talk about climate equity and climate justice and empowering native peoples and, and farmer owned cooperatives in the third world and God knows what the hell else. Uh, and, and you can see that getting wrapped up. Now, once something gets wrapped up with all these other causes and with a sharply partisan uh, political bent, it, it's about getting rid of capitalism itself. It's about, it's no longer, I mean, you can't make the case to, to lower GDP, to, to make GDP 5% better in 2100. You can't spend more than 5% of GDP today, <laughs> but there's really a case that we have to, you know, we have to go back to the, the farms of our miserable ancestors uh, here. Um, so it got wrapped up in that, I, I wouldn't call it a Trojan horse because there's deviousness. Uh, I think, you know, I, I know lots of people on this thing. I, I think they're all very honest people, but they're the kind of people who used to go to church a lot. <laughs> And and uh, now find their self validation in in the very uh, uh, moral political parts of the whole woke cause, which is too bad because I would like us to do something serious about the climate, 
as you would. Um, you know, if if nuclear nuclear has been regulated out of innovation, if we could get Moore's law going on nuclear power, we'd be talking about what to do all, with all the extra stuff. Yeah, imagine a bunch of nuclear power plants way out in the desert, powering carbon capture and storage units. Um, powering desalination plants, you, you could do wonderful things. Uh, I think we'll get there actually. Uh, so let, let me be cheerful. Uh, <laughs> Glasgow ended with a fizzle uh, and uh, the energy prices are, it's hilarious that, that you know, Biden on day one uh, banished the Keystone pipeline and on day two started pleading with the Russians and OPEC to pump more gas and energy. <laughs> uh, beca- and, and now he's, it, it, just today he was in the news uh, uh, you know, he wants the Federal Trade Commission to investigate uh, oil companies for price fixing on raising gas prices, like 1972 again. Uh, so um, democracies are, are clearly going to be unhappy. The whole point of uh, uh, if you kill fossil fuels, the prices are going up and the voters are going to get mad. Uh, so I, I think this uh, they're going to try to do it by strangling fossil via regu- financial regulation. Uh, I think that's so preposterously, obviously uh, not true that that's not going to fail. So what's going to happen? Well, I've been in touch with a bunch of climate types. There is a huge amount of technical innovation on its way to provide uh, low uh, low carbon emission energy. If only we can, in, in the case of nuclear, it's hilarious. Where we regulate against <laughs> nuclear power. Uh, but if, if only it'll be allowed, I, I think the uh, the innovation, I mean, solar cells are, are, are solar cells are a big part of it. And, and the price of them has declined ridiculously, has very, very cheap now. What do we do? We have a 25% tariff on solar cells because they have to be made in America. Hmm. Mother Gaia doesn't really care where they're made. <clears throat> uh, that kind of ridiculousness, I hope will pass. So I, I do think, with, I don't, the earth is not going to fall apart. And I do think the, uh, the technical innovation and adaptation is going to get us through this, despite uh, all of the efforts on the policy side. I think the the common denominator between kind of the 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 reason why a lot of people can't see or, or don't know about these solutions like nuclear, you know, these people who there's all these studies. Oh, there's like you know, all these kids have anxiety, climate anxiety, or something, which is just my kids have climate anxiety, so it, it's it's true. <laughs> they, I, I mean. It, but like it could be okay. You wouldn't have anxiety if uh, about the climate if it's like oh well we have the solution we have we have nuclear we have nat gas all this stuff and so uh, my point to that plus um, it, you know what you're talking about about how the fact that we we continue to elect worse and worse more incompetent leaders I think that the common denominator is the news media and the fact that the media more or less underwrites reality. And that we actually have a system where they sit upstream of the power in this country because they have the ability to shape what people think and feel and more or less through story selection, right? What to focus on. And so I know this is something that you've thought a lot about. Well, the the media, the the major media have been an obvious catastrophe. Um, and, and uh, turn themselves into just parroting whatever ridiculous a line there is. Uh, James Freeman had a great a Wall Street Journal op-ed I'll recommend. It was from like yesterday or so. It just, it just He listed all of the fables the major media has passed along without the slightest bit of investigation over the last uh, four years. But, um, you know, there's a corrective force and, and you are that corrective force. Uh, <laughs> we do for until they regulate the, they desperately want to regulate uh, the internet precisely to stop uh, this, you know, stop the possibility of free speech from leaking out. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, it is still possible in the U.S. for you and I to have this conversation and for anyone who wants to, to listen to it in a way that is not possible in China. Uh, and I think the the mainstream, nobody trusts mainstream media anymore. So, um, uh, you know, there's some hope uh, that that and, and most Americans don't, you know, they don't read the New York Times and the Washington Post. Um, now, there's it's kind of too bad that the chattering classes around policy are, are all in that bubble, but um, at least there's, I'm trying to be hopeful. <laughs> there's other ways of getting the news out. And there's, you know, for example, Substack has been a, uh, you know, watch Barry Weiss on Substack. Uh, there's a great example of, uh, you know, the New York Times is failing. She started something new. Podcasters are starting something new. I got to 
Yeah, I, I do think that um, you know, Goodfellas is 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 is. But, but should, well, what's missing? But you're right. Um, so we can express opinion, but what's missing is the investigative skepticism that large major media used to have. That when you know somebody says Trump is colluding with the Russians, I don't know, pick whatever fable of the last uh, uh, five years or so that somebody would dig in. And, and say, look, the facts aren't here. Or when someone says, says we need to stop talking about climate emergency and talk about climate catastrophe, someone would actually read the IPCC report. I mean, the technical parts, not the summary for policymakers. Go read the actual tables in there like, like Steve Coonan does and say, wait a minute, <laughs> you don't have to dig that far to be a good investigative reporter here. But um, so that, that's, uh, uh, that's missing from the current landscape, yeah. I think I think in terms of uh, the the super macro, one of these trends was when they took down Nixon. I, I think that that was kind of the the point where journalism became this noble crusade to kind of bag the biggest game that you could. And you see this where they try to take down companies, taking down Uber, just relentlessly attacking. They've been rel- relentlessly attacking Facebook. Obviously, there are certain people in in politics that they do attack and don't attack. Um, but the goal is to to kind of put a, you know a, a head on a spike. But when you talk about and, and I do you know the thing that's so frustrating is it is the actual purpose that we've kind of all been sold about journalism and exactly what you're saying this kind of like check on power investigative journalism. You know what if this what if this politician is you know using taxpayer dollars to go buy personal stuff whatever it is that would be corrupt like that is super important. And I think that that's, that really is what's missing. And then also in today's information landscape, I mean, there's so much they're, they're skeptical of one, one side of power, but just pass on the uh, spin of the other side of power completely. Uh, uh, so they, they become pass on the narrative, not, uh, not skeptical of power in general. Yes. I, I, I do think uh, perhaps there is hope with, with, uh, with the internet. I think it's just going to take a while for, People well, there's a desperate desire to, to censor the internet. I mean, the internet censoring itself uh, in advance of the government. So, um, I mean, I think that's the, the greatest danger. And it, it comes from both sides. Uh, you know, Republicans are, are aghast at the fact that they got censored by the internet, and they're, but they're turning to regulation. And uh, of course, Democrats love the idea of regulating the internet and nothing like the FTC breathing down on you to say, you know, we're going to uh, we're going to ruin your company to make sure that you uh, change the filters to, to, you know, have the party in power now look better on the internet. Um, so I, I think that's that's a great danger. Uh, the only hope is that, um, you know, what, what regulation does. It's, it's a regulation always ends up preserving today's monopolies. <laughs> So, uh, you know, if, if Facebook and, and Google want to censor um, conservative ideas, uh, well, the, usually the corrective for that was, well, somebody else will come put something else in. But um, a re- regulation of, of the current ones always comes with keeping them in power. And that's I think that's a big danger. And that's why that's why Facebook and Google are the ones pushing for more and more regulation, because, yeah. they know, they'll be the ones to that'll be able to comply. All the yeah. lawyers. And you got to, I mean, Facebook wants to spend God knows how many billion dollars making the world a big video game. Uh, <laughs> you, can, you can tell they're scared to death that they're going to be the next AOL Time Warner Netscape. Uh, and uh, for good reason. Now, one thing that we didn't talk about on the last podcast. So when you, 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 you talk about journalists not reading the actual reports, I think, you know, I, I tweeted this out a while ago. I, I don't, think I've ever read an article about Bitcoin where the actual reporter had read the Bitcoin white paper. Like it's pretty obvious they had not actually read the white paper, which is only like 10 pages long. And so what is John Cochran's view on Bitcoin? Uh, um, well, I haven't read the white paper either, but I have read. Okay. It. Okay. <laughs> but you, you do know economics. And this so Bit- Bitcoin, economics. cryptocurrency, many inventions are it's not clear um, what is the question to which they are the answer for a long time. Um, uh, you know, Alexander Graham Bell thought the telephone was going to help deaf people. Marconi thought the radio was going to be a telephone. Nobody ever thought 
that the radio was going to be useful for uh, for broadcast. It's just it wasn't the idea of broadcasting. It, it took years before people figured that out. Uh, and certainly nobody uh, putting together the internet thought that sharing cat videos or or <laughs> or tweets was going to be what the the main purpose of connecting computers together. So I do think Bitcoin is a bit like that. It's a very interesting technology, but I don't think we've figured out what it's useful for. It is certainly not. So there's a lot of technological advance, but there is not not one bit of advance in um, financial or monetary technology. Uh, every use so far has implemented an old idea for how uh, money and, and finance works. Uh, Bitcoin is invented to be sort of like gold, or, uh, or it, it was invented to be like gold. It's a thing that's inherently not very useful, but it's in limited supply. Uh, well, we know how gold worked out. <laughs> Uh, its its price is very volatile, and it's not actually very convenient for making transactions. Uh, so uh, Bitcoin really isn't well designed to be an alternative money. Now, right now, lots of things are useful because they get around nitwit regulations. And so a lot of what crypto is doing is very inefficiently recreating financial structures in a way that gets around the SEC's regulation about what is uh, what is a security and what isn't a security. Uh, Bitcoin is very useful for um, uh, ransomware attacks. Uh, it's useful for illegal stuff. And, and lots of illegal stuff is good. Let's remember, this is the problem on our way to central bank digital currency. Uh, if we in Getting money out of China, getting money into Venezuela illegally, those are wonderful things. <laughs> um, and if we, impose every law, every, if we impose every law on who can buy and sell what in the U.S., uh, heaven help us, um, you know, every undocumented immigrant is suddenly unemployed. So a little bit of illegal transactions is good. But of course, you know, the government's got to raise taxes somehow. Uh, anyway, uh, you asked me where's Bitcoin going, and I'm, I'm on the larger question. Of, well, not, not necessarily going. I mean, I just, you know, you're, I think the, to, to, to the beginning of your answer, the initial use case is, is certainly store of value. And the fact that you don't need but there's no value. to so with the fiat, it's inherently worthless fiat currency. So Bitcoin, uh, I'll stick with it may take a long time and, and everyone it'll go up on the way. But uh, Bitcoin is is inherently worthless. And the, the, the problem with its design is you can only make so many Bitcoins, but there's nothing that stops you from making other substitute coins. Uh, it's as if you could easily say, well, we run out of gold, but let's dig up silver and use those coins instead. Or let's, you know, copper or something else, except infinite amounts. So just basic monetary economics says over the long run, Bitcoin as inherently worthless security has got to transition to zero. Um, Wouldn't and the, fiat be inherently worthless? Fiat is inherently worthless. Uh, our, our, but our, our currency is not fiat currency. Our currency is backed by the taxes uh, that the U.S. government can collect. Um, so it is it, it's, uh, exactly a pure fiat currency. Every time you try a pure fiat currency, it hyperinflates away <laughs> sooner or later. Uh, and that's exactly, I think, what has to happen. Uh, and it'll happen. Now, Bitcoin is, you can't print up too many Bitcoins, but you can print up substitutes. Uh, and, and that's, I think, the key problem with Bitcoin. I think you end up with back, the, the backed coins um, are, are, you know, a backed currency can maintain its value. Problem with a backed coin is, you know, a stable coin that's 100% backed is that it's much less profitable to issue that. It's much more fun to print up stuff that's free to print up. Um, so I think, and then, the, then there's the question of central ledgers versus decentralized. And there's all the other uses though. I think that's where um, we're, we're fascinated by this first use of reinventing gold, which wasn't the great money. We have much better monies now than gold. So second use, let's reinvent modern money, uh, stable value, completely backed electronic trade. Eh, well, it's not obvious crypto is the right the answer to that. But for example, but the, the idea of, of having a decentralized contract, you know, why does it take three, year, three days to clear a stock, for example, or the, you know, keeping property rights, you know, the paintings that you see behind me, I guess we're on audio, so they don't get to see the paintings, but the idea of, um, uh, the idea of a, a property right where you own a painting and then when you resell the painting, you have the, the token that include, encodes the property right and that pays the author back. The, 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 those are examples of use of blockchain technology uh, that I think are, are going to going to be going to stick with us. 
Well, I, I think uh, I, I think over the course of our, our conversations, hopefully this one isn't the last. I'll, I'll try to win you over to Bitcoin uh, because I am a Bitcoiner and I do think that it is freedom money. Um, what I would like to see. Um, yeah, well, I I'm, think, I'm all for freedom money, by the way. Uh, I just, yeah, uh, I, that's what I thought. That's why yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think this is the one. <laughs> but good luck to you. I think things, you know, think it's kind of like modern art. Uh, things can. Uh, things that are inherently worthless, but uh, uh, people are willing to pay a lot for for a while and speculate on while they go up, and eventually someone's holding the bag. Now, now the the okay, let's let's talk about the the central bank digital currency because to me this is like out of 1984. This is terrifying. Um, there was the so the this woman who is the candidate for the comptroller of the currency um, in Biden Treasury Department. She has yes. said that she wants to get rid of all bank accounts and everyone, every American citizen would just have an account at the Fed. I'm not sure if this is exactly the same thing as a central bank digital currency. It seems like it's part and parcel, but that's exactly. terrifying. So, I, uh, so she's wrong about everything else, uh, but uh, and wrong about this one, right about this one for the wrong reasons. But, you know, even a broken clock is right to twice a day. Um, I would not be so with some nuance. Uh, we need better payment systems. Uh, you, you know, when you buy something with a credit and a debit card, um, the credit card companies take two to 4% off the top, which is ridiculous. Uh, and it's it's slow, it's inefficient. Uh, you got to, on a website, you got to punch in your numbers all the time. It's just ridiculous. So fast digital payments. Um, most Americans can't get bank accounts because it's so regulated that, you know, they, they have to charge a lot. You know, if, if you're an average Joe with 500 bucks, the banks don't want to talk to you. So, uh, you know, fast digital payments accessible to uh, the people of a few means uh, and cheap digital payments. That, that's something. And uh, our digital money is so digital money is a good idea. Now, uh, it's also um, uh it's funny, a lot of the objections to her proposal were that, oh, this will starve banks of deposits. Where will they get their money from? Well, um, banks are, are screwing us over here. We're getting low rates of return on deposits that uh, because it's so highly regulated and protected. Uh, so I'm all for the basic concept that we should have um, fast digital payments that pay us where our accounts pay us interest. Uh, and that's technically possible. Uh, now, central... I'm worried about central bank digital currency for the same reason you are. Um, if every payment you have goes through the central bank, then the government watches everything you buy and sell. Goodbye, Liberty. I mean, the, the freedom to buy, uh, too bad they didn't think to put that in the Bill of Rights, but the freedom that, it, that if you want to sell me an apple and I want to pay, give you some money for that apple, that the federal government doesn't need to know about that transaction. That's like one of the most elemental freedoms. If you don't have the freedom to buy and sell, you, you are, you know, you might as well be living in a Chinese labor camp. Um, and, and if central bank digital currency goes through the central bank, then the government can watch everything you, you do, which is, uh, you know, Imagine how easy it would be to take down any political candidate if you could leak the history of their transactions. Uh, so that's uh, th this is the key problem with central bank digital currency is anonymity versus uh, versus efficiency. So I think the right answer is that the the cent we should have uh, private companies that are just payments companies. Uh, so you have an account and they pay you interest. It's not a bank. Uh, all it does is process payments as quickly and cheaply as possible. And it is backed 100%. So the, that money doesn't flow into mortgage-backed securities, which might blow up every 10 years and need a bailout. Uh, that money goes straight into uh, either reserves of the Fed or short-term treasuries. Now, if it's a private company, the other problem with central bank digital currency is lose your password. Who are you going to call? Hey, Jay, uh, I lost my password. <laughs> uh, seriously, does the Federal Reserve have the capacity to build a efficient customer facing universe, uh, person, uh, 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 interface. And couldn't even build a healthcare website. To exactly, and to handle customer accounts and complaints and to implement its own regulation, it would kind of, be, kind of be funny. Imagine the Federal Reserve trying to implement its own know your customer regulations and all the banking regulations. It took, it took Citibank, Citibank, I think, spent $100 million on their regulatory compliance just, just to bring it up to Dodd Frank. It'd be hilarious to watch the Fed try. So private companies handle that, but they're just payment companies. They're, all those deposits are 100% backed 
uh, either at the Fed or the Treasury. I'll get to that in a minute. But then it's private, and the government needs a subpoena to go look at your records. And I think there's a balance. If, it, if it's completely anonymous, then nobody ever pays taxes again. So uh, you, you, you need to have, you know, kind of what we have now. Now, the IRS, they're trying, they're trying to get rid of this. The IRS wants access to your entire bank account history just as a matter of course. That's a disaster. Then the government could think how easy it would be to out anybody with their transaction history. So uh, I think that's, now the Fed is fighting that tooth and nail. The Fed is, is illegally denying narrow banks the right to operate that way. So the Fed is not a natural, and that's why, the digital central bank digital currency is is kind of on you know the last scene of the Raiders of the Lost Ark where where it goes into the big warehouse and we have top people working on it top top people <laughs> because central bank this is a grave threat to the subsidized deposits that the banks live off of and the Fed loves to keep the banks profitable so really I think the right answer is that and the Fed by the way is legally not allowed to let you and me have accounts there it, it's a bank. Uh, for banks. And it, it's it's the agency that loves banks and keeps them profitable. <laughs> so the right answer is the treasury should do this. Uh, the treasury should offer, go to treasurydirect.gov, where you can buy treasury securities. You should be able to buy a, a fic, an account at treasury.gov, which has, fic, it's worth $1 and it pays interest and it's electronically transferable. They should create reserves at the, now why? Because the treasury is allowed already legally to, to take you and my money. And then, you know, those kinds of things could be the backing for private, uh, uh, for, for private aid. So where, where are we going? Uh, we need uh, better cheap payments. I mean, that Nigerians on their cell phones have cheaper electronic payment systems than we have. Uh, Chinese via WhatsApp have cheaper, uh, fast, accessible to the, the poorest people, uh, electronic payments uh, that, that we don't have. So we should have that. And, um, and, and, and it, for financial stability reasons, it would be great if you could just have a payments company that does that kind of thing and is not involved in making loans and mortgages and all the other stuff. It's just a payment. And, and then that thing can never, if it, if it has your account and is invested at the Fed or the Treasury, it can never go bankrupt. We've done no more financial crises ever again. That's that's a worthy thing. Um, by making it private, your your uh, you know companies know how to do user interface. The government knows how to make a security that will that can never fail, which is uh, you know because reserves only promise you more reserves. The Fed can never go bankrupt. The you know the Treasury debt they can always just give you more Treasury debt if they want to. Uh, so I think that's where it needs to go. And then the banks need to start uh, borrowing uh, via long-term debt and equity to invest risky investments. And then, so what do we got? We got cheap payments, uh, access to the poorest of Americans, the financial system, and banks that never fail again. Uh, and we've preserved uh, you know, the right, some sort of uh, between efficiency, anonymity, and, and efficiency, we got it. So what's, what's not to like about that? Well, I, that, I mean, this is the first that I've heard uh, of this idea for sure. So this is the, this is uh it's super interesting. I know that, you know, the, the audience members of this podcast that are Bitcoiners, and I know there's quite a few would definitely be mad at me if I didn't say that Bitcoin does a lot of that it's specifically the lightning network offers instantaneous settlement to any account anywhere in the world. Now, I think kind of the point that you're making or made earlier is that, you know, the, 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 the fluctuation in the price and, you know, why would you even use it as a payment if it continues to appreciate? Uh, you know, those are all valid concerns, I think. Um, but I have, I have to point that out that I think Bitcoin does a, a lot of that stuff and it's decentralized. So there is no risk of, um, and, and I know that you kind of address that, but the risk of perhaps um, seizure yeah. without. Well, there's no, uh, Bitcoin, uh, this is the problem with the stable coins. <laughs> Bitcoin makes no promises. Um, you have Bitcoin, it's only more Bitcoin. So it can't, that has a good advantage there. Uh, the stable, the, the supposedly backed Bitcoins, they've reinvented the 19th century bank. Uh, where they say, well, there's some pot of assets here somewhere. And um, who knows if those assets are worth anything. So, uh, you know, when, when I said we haven't reinvented anything new, they reinvent the 19th century bank. And that wasn't a great system either. Uh, now, now, what about what about converting dollars into Bitcoin? So going back to a standard, except instead of gold, it's Bitcoin. You know, that's that's something that I think is is probably the best solution. I mean, if you 
you know. Well, no, no, few... no, no. This is the where we're naturally going to go with Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin, actual Bitcoin transactions. You already mentioned exchange. Bitcoin transactions are are expensive. They're you know, uh, uh, it, it's hard to do them. So what we do is we create new securities that are claims to Bitcoins. We create the 19th century bank, which says, well, Bitcoins themselves are a little bit inconvenient. So I'll offer you a deposit, uh, give uh, which promises to pay Bitcoins. What happens when everybody wants the underlying Bitcoins all at once? You can have a run on a deposit that claims Bitcoins. I see what you're saying. And that, that would be true for the dollar. Yeah. As well. if the dollar yeah. Is, so 19th century, the dollar is a promise to pay gold. So it's, you get pieces of paper and each yep. piece of paper says, I promise to give you gold. Uh, what if everybody at the same time says, I want my gold? <laughs> Uh, what we had actually in the 19th century is more like Bitcoin. Uh, bank banks there weren't banks issued notes that were you know one dollar in gold payable at the first bank of Topeka, Kansas, and uh, you know every now and then everybody uh, was worried about that and they ran in and said I want my gold at the same time. There wasn't enough gold. Boom. Uh, so that's we got a thousand years of monetary uh, history to uh, to reinvent here. <laughs> <laughs> now, I well, this is why I love doing this podcast because I I, I have not thought about that. But let, let's the last question on this this topic. The the thing that's kind of revelatory for me is when you go back to first principles. Why do we entrust our medium of exchange to the government? You know, think about that. Why why do we actually have that? Why couldn't it just be? Um, you know, any private actor, whether that's Bitcoin, a company, whatever it is, when you think about it, that gives the the, the federal government a tremendous amount of power. And you think about, um, you know, the history of money, it, ha- it wasn't always that way. So what is, you know, your, your view of that kind of trade off? Right uh, I think it's a, a natural evolution that may come to a uh that may come to a sudden stop and then Bitcoin's coiners will have their day. Um, <laughs> you need to, you need a money, you need something pure fiat money. Here's a dollar. It is what it is. Always gets overprinted. <laughs> so you need a money that is backed by something real. And uh, the first idea was backed by gold, but again, you know, got all those problems with, with gold. So, you know, the prices, the relative pr- gold was, was, was great for a thousand years. I mean, we didn't have, we didn't. We never had inflation, permanent inflation, but there was a lot of variation in prices. There's kind of shortages. There were there were runs and so forth. Um, then we moved on to bank accounts. Now bank accounts are backed. They were backed by mortgages and loans. Uh, so there's something real there backing this issue of paper. But as you saw, that 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 was imperfect too. Uh, we moved to dollars. Uh, now for a thousand years, every time somebody, every government printed up money, it always quickly inflated. Mostly they were printing up money because they didn't know how to pay, you know, the continental dollar, the U.S. in the 1790s. Right, right. Did away, boom, off, off it's gone. It was always a, a last resort of governments who, who, uh, who were running out of, uh, uh, who, who uh, needed to finance deficits. And it took, you know, the 1970s weren't that pleasant. <laughs> it, it took us 50 years to manage the current system. If you have a government that is, sober and responsible that is uh, not running perpetual $5 trillion deficits, but that runs steady surpluses. Uh, When it borrows money, it then raises taxes or cuts spending to pay that money back. Uh, The debt of a responsible government is a wonderful thing on which to base some money because the government has a unique ability, such a government can do something that nobody else can do, which is if, if needed, it can raise taxes. <laughs> if there's too much money floating around and inflation's going on, a government can say, well, we'll raise, it's not, private company is always, always maximizing profits. A well-run government has some room <laughs> to make some more profits. And so um, we evolved to this system because for, since 1945, uh, Western governments were, not perfect, but more and more responsible about uh, paying back their debts. And the thousand year history of government debt always ending in a default, a crisis or an inflation <clears throat> was slowly put to rest. So un- until a year ago, <laughs> we were in this situation that despite kind of concerning debts and deficits, people trust that the US government, when all is said and done, will do what it takes to repay and not inflate away its debt. So it's a natural 
you know, you, you look around for what are you going to use for money? And, you know, in, in, in post-World War II, they used cigarettes for money because what do we have that's kind of a store of value and medium of exchange? And, you know, gold coins, well, <clears throat> that's kind of useful, store of value, medium of exchange, and so forth. Short-term government debt of a responsible government uh, is a darn good uh, thing rather than cigarettes or, or clamshells or gold coins or claims to Farmer Brown's mortgage. Uh, it's a natural store of value to use, and there's lots of it. And, and the government, as long as the government is running surpluses or you know, is fiscally responsible, uh, it's a very safe liquid. It's, 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 you know, nobody knows anything more than anybody else about what the value of this thing is. It's a safe liquid store of value. Why not use short-term government debt? And that's what we're doing. I mean, money, our money is just short-term government debt. Uh, now, how long does that last is, is the good question. You know, we got a thousand years of governments printing up too much of the stuff and then eventually defaulting or inflating on it. And uh, I worry, I think, as you do and the Bitcoiners do, that we may be headed for that. And, and if that happens, then um, maybe not Bitcoin, but it's, you know, some completely privately defined standard of value will have its day. The problem is uh, something that is stable in value, unlike Bitcoin, and that is big enough to, that everyone can have some. Um, so it'll be fun. It'll be interesting, although an absolute tragedy. If, if, if we lose government debt as the standard of value, the, the chaos and, uh, that will go along. I mean, it's just asta it's astounding. In the debt limit talks, our Treasury Secretary said, if we hit the debt limit, we will default. That's a choice. She could have said U.S. government debt comes first. We will never default on U.S. government debt. We'll cut checks to social. We'll cut the checks to the social security if we have to, but we'll never default on debt. So the commitment to never default or inflate away U.S. debt. In fact, we just inflated away. The inflation we have now is already six percent. It's like a partial default. Six percent of the value of U.S. government debt's down the toilet. Uh, so it's not unthinkable that this crisis comes and everybody says, you know what, this government debt stuff is just as bad as it was when Edward the, when the Peruzzi, when Edward III defaulted on the Peruzzi in 1350 and started the first sovereign debt crisis. Um, so that, that would be an immense financial catastrophe on the way towards your world of, of Bitcoin taking over. And let's hope it doesn't happen. Yeah, I mean, I, I almost want to save the audience debt talk because I talk about it personally so much. And uh, but but it is, I mean... I've been working on this for 10 years. Uh, it's it's the most important issue in my opinion. And, you know, the one thing I'll say on this is, you know, we touched on this earlier in the conversation. Well, this is one, uh, unlike climate change, it's the least important issue until all of a sudden it's the most important issue. Uh, unlike right. climate change, this is not, debt is not something where the sea level rises two millimeters a year until you forgot to make a dam. Uh, debt is something that sits there and looks completely, uh, so what, you know, interest rates are low, we don't care, until all of a sudden, boom. Uh, so it always comes. It's like the it's like the Spanish Inquisition. It comes when nobody expects it. And, and unlike climate change, which comes slowly and predictably. I mean, it's, 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 it's my understanding that basically the reason why it matters so much and so is correlated to inflation is that right now we are printing all of this money and, and the 6 trillion that was issued in new debt, about half of that was purchased by the federal reserve. And you have a post on the grumpy economist about how they don't actually hold it there, which is, which is, I thought was really interesting, but if you want to touch on that in your answer, but, um, about half purchased by the Federal Reserve, which would mean, and, and I want you to correct me if I'm wrong here, this is my understanding, which would mean that the interest rate on the federal debt that was issued is being artificially held down because there wasn't enough natural demand in the market to fill that six trillion. They only could fill half. And so the natural interest rate, which would which is basically a confidence signal um, from from markets to uh, to to you know, the the basically to to the treasury saying you know this is what we think your your debt is worth um, that that signal is would basically be an alarm bell or start to be an alarm bell because the interest rates would be higher they wouldn't want the demand isn't there at the current interest rates hey we need more money because we think you're a riskier bet and by the way foreign holders of our debt, which I know you touched on, have now basically disappeared. And so the the problem with this is that 
again, it's my understanding here. The problem with, with this is that inflation is almost guaranteed because interest rates will go up if the Fed does not backfill that demand to meet the debt service. And if interest rates go up, then the interest expense on the debt will become incredibly expensive and we will have to either issue more debt and domestic uh, whole domestic demand will will come in and say, and foreign demand's already out of the picture, will come in and say, actually, this is actually going to be more money because it's a riskier bet. And so the Fed only has the option of saying, well, okay, you know, we can't do that because we can't afford it. So we need to print more money. They print more money and all of a sudden inflation continues to go up. Is I that think, what's, is, is this the spiral? <laughs> does this make any sense? Uh, no, I think you're half right here. Okay. Uh, um, I don't think the Fed has as much power to hold down long-term rates as, as for a long time, as you're saying. They did step in and start buying uh, all the new treasury issues for a couple of years, but they were they were looking at hiccups in the market. Um, so you know, maybe half a percentage point I'll give you, but but not the huge amounts for years that you're talking about. It is true that foreigners have stopped buying uh, treasuries. Um, so I'm seeing canaries in the coal mine, and that's that's one of them. The hiccups in so it, usually in crises, foreigners run to buy treasuries. This time they ran to sell treasuries. Part of those hiccups were uh, the, um, the problems of the Dodd-Frank regulations, which people had been pointing out for years and the Fed never got around to fixing, speaking of bureaucratic uh, inertia. Um, but I, I, don't think the, uh, I, I don't think that's that's the big story. The real question for inflation, and this kind of circles back, I was hemming and hawing with some uh, with some ifs, ands, or buts on the when on your first question. Um, when, uh, so really, whether the Fed prints, gives people reserves or the Treasury gives people Treasury bills doesn't really matter to first order. It, it does matter a bit because it goes to different people. Uh, this time, so the big question is why this, in this stimulus, why did we get inflation? And in the 2008-9 stimulus, we didn't get inflation. Part of it is yes, because uh, it was, we gave people directly reserves at the Fed rather than treasury bills. But, you know, reserves at the Fed and treasury bills are to first order the same thing. So uh, I think that that made it go. We gave it to people who are more likely to spend it um, rather than, you know, through other means. But I think the other canary in the coal mine is it's got to be that this time uh, we printed up a lot of money, reserves or treasury debt. It's, it's really all the same stuff. It's all government debt. Um, this time, evidently, people didn't think the government's going to pay it back. Uh, you know, if, if we give, if you give people five trillion dollars, and you say, "Oh, by the way, uh, next year taxes are going up five trillion dollars," that doesn't cause any inflation. They'd say, "Oh shit!" You know, we got sorry. Oh, uh, <laughs> oh darn! Uh, we got to we got uh, to hold this money because we got to pay the taxes next year. Uh, evidently. Uh, this is the second canary in the coal mine. Uh, we handed out all this debt and people, you know, either money or government debt. And people said, hmm, uh, this is like free stuff. We can spend it. And uh, the, the government's not going to pay back this debt. And if you listen to them, they, you know, the, 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 uh, it was very different, at least in 2008 and 9. They had the decency to say, this is stimulus spending. Yes, there's big deficits, but in the future, trust us, we're going to go back and solve the de you know deficit projections, and we you know we're going to solve the debt problems and so on and so forth. Now it was all we, all of us kind of chuckled at that, uh, but at least they had the decency to say, uh, you know, we want to put the U.S. on a long run trajectory. You know, you know, every president says exactly um, exactly uh, the day after I leave office, we're going to start the deficit reduction. But at least they had the decency to say that this time around, there was no talk whatsoever about deficit today, but sobriety tomorrow. Uh, you know, dear Lord, give me give me uh, surpluses, but only after I leave office. Um, the only talk was about how modern monetary theory means you never have to pay back debts, about how low interest rates means that, uh, you know, we, we never have to we, we can print money and never have to worry about it again. R is less than G. Uh, so. Um, this is the puzzle in my, you know, why did this stimulus cause inflation and the last stimulus didn't? Uh, well, it, it goes back to what you're saying. People clearly this time don't think the government's going to pay back that debt. Now that is, to your point, are we going to get more inflation? Uh, we're still running huge deficits and there's 
you know, they're planning more huge deficits. Well, if people think those deficits are going to be paid back, the government is like a worthy borrower who's going to borrow some money now for some useful project and pay it back later, then it doesn't cause inflation. But the second canary in the coal mine is that clearly, if they didn't think the stimulus was going to get paid back, why do they think that the Build Back Better borrowing is going to get paid back? Uh, so we may be on that tipping point if people think, mm -hmm. uh, this government's not going to pay back its debts. And then here we go. I think the, the, the I just looked, the, the Fed's buying 80 billion dollars worth of treasuries a month and then last month it was it was down to 70 and i guess to, to put a cap on this this segment you're saying that that's not necessarily going to cause inflation no i i don't so i i have to be consistent here <laughs> i don't think qe qe was a signaling uh the, the fed buying uh it, 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 so it's bad <laughs> The, one of the main reasons it's it's troubling is because it shortens the maturity structure of government debt. Uh, if the, you you're buying a house, if you buy a house and you buy the and you get the thirty year fixed, you pay a little more. But if interest rates go up, no problem. If you get the floating rate, uh, uh, the adjustable rate mortgage, you pay a little bit less. But if interest rates go up, you lose the house. Uh, we are already uh, our federal government borrows way short. The, the adjustable rates about a one that we turn over the debt, half the debt turns over about every year and a half. And the and by buying up all the long-term debt and and issuing overnight debt. Half, oh yeah, I'm sorry. Let me, I just want to put an explanation point on that. Half of the debt turns over sorry, about every half year and the debt every, Roughly half the debt every, every two years gets rolled over. Uh, so it's very okay. short. Term. Yeah, because I, I know, I, I think it was, yeah, it was, it was either you or Brian Rito that said that, that taught me the average maturity was about 60 months. But then- well, Yeah, average maturity is a terrible number. So okay, uh, why is that? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, average maturity is uh, it's the it doesn't include the coupons, uh, and so it's the average maturity of the uh, of the principal repayment. So I promise to pay you hundred bucks in five gotcha, years, gotcha, hundred gotcha. bucks in ten years. We average that and say it's seven and a half. Well, um, what what re a better number is add the principal and the coupons. At the number I gave you is when is half of all the money due? So uh, when do I have to roll over half of the debt? And that, that number is, last time I looked was about two years. Uh, average maturity, just to give you an example, suppose I borrow $20 trillion in overnight debt and I borrow $1 as a perpetuity. In other words, there's, no, there's never a principal and I just pay interest forever. What's the average maturity of the debt? Answer, infinity. <laughs> because I have $1 of infinite maturity debt and $20 trillion of overnight debt. And the average of infinity and overnight is infinity. <laughs> so that's a, a good, you know, the duration of the debt is a better uh, measure or the simple measure I gave you on average rollover. The, the, the numbers that you get are all, there's it's 19th century debt accounting numbers. Uh, when they tell you that the amount of debt the US government has, it's the total amount of the principal. It's not market value and it doesn't include coupons. Come on, guys. Uh, when they, they tell you the average maturity, we've known how to compute duration. Uh, <clears throat> that's the derivative of value with respect to interest rate. We've known how to compute that for 100 years. They, they don't compute. And we know how to compute. Every bank has to give you a mark-to-market value. The central government doesn't give you a mark-to-market value. So anyway, yes, we are very short-term. And the Fed by buying has made it shorter term. And so we're more exposed to uh, crisis. But the Fed by... Uh, um, uh, the actual, um, you know, they just need to have a, a new, it's hilarious. The treasury issues long, the Fed buys and reissues short. It, it's like the, the husband goes down to get the 30 year fixed and the wife goes into the bank and says, and swaps it out and says, no, I want the floating rate. You know, get, get your act together, guys. Figure out the maturity structure of debt. That's really, uh, that's really all that's going on here. It's very symbolic though. So why do we get all upset about the Fed tapering its purchases because everybody kind of understands that first you taper the purchases, then you raise the interest rates. So um, in all of the literature on quantitative easing and purchases and so forth, uh, the only sensible argument I can see about it mattering is that it's a signal of when interest rate rises are coming. That's that's super interesting. Um, I, I feel like the thing that we've kind of danced around here the entire time, that, that's probably a good a good segment to to take us home is 
institutions. So there's kind of a, you know, we've talked a lot about institutional failure without talking about it. It's kind of this thing that, um, you know, everybody knows about now, everybody talks about now, it's become a little trite, but it's something that needs an answer. Perhaps there's no one answer, but it kind of comes down to a, a debate between do we build new institutions or do we try to fix the ones that we have or some sort of combination? Or does the competition from new institutions force the ones that we've had to finally fix themselves? Yes, go ahead. Right. So yeah, in new institutions, you have the the University of Austin uh, yeah. and I'm in Austin, Texas. And I think that um, it is a, a great place to, to house this new thing. And we talked about we haven't, I'm sorry, we haven't talked about yet Stanford. So you wrote this piece about free speech at Stanford. Now, Stanford, in my mind, is the crown jewel of academia of the United States. Uh, a lot of people would say, you know, Harvard or Yale, but they obviously haven't spent much time on the farm and have seen the thing because Stanford really is truly beautiful. So I think that, uh, you know, the the tie goes to the runner there. Now, and Hoover is the best part of Stanford, of course, but please and go ahead. Hoover, the Hoover, the Hoover <laughs> Tower right there in the center of campus. Now, I want to talk, we'll, we'll get to the broader institutional debate, but let's talk about this specific piece at Stanford and maybe perhaps how the University of Austin or anything like that could could help drive solutions here. But, you know, you have this letter about academic freedom and free speech at Stanford. And there's a guy, the Stanford, you have the Stanford Faculty Senate has commissioned a report on speech on speech and academic expression chaired by professor David Palumbu Liu. And this is who they chose to, to chair this thing. And I went and I looked him up on Twitter and he is quote tweeting a Salesforce tweet right here. And it says the, this is the Salesforce tweet the, there's a disconnect between employers and employees that extends beyond return to office policies, read how to create a new operating model that works for everyone. And he quote tweeted it and he said, it's called communism which is a, a pretty clear as day advocation of communism from a professor at Stanford, the crown jewel of American academia is calling for communism. And this is the person who is put in charge of a report on speech and academic expression. Last time I checked, communism is not necessarily the nicest to free speech and academic expression and everything. So what is going on? Well, I'm, I, I'm, I'm for radical free speech, so I'm happy to have communists on, on campus and let them speak, uh, so long as sure. they let, let us speak. Um, uh, the sense in which uh, putting Palumbaloo in charge of this uh, free speech question is like putting the fox in charge of the hen house is uh, his uh, attacks on what you and I might consider free speech. He was the leader of the uh, effort to um, kick Hoover off campus. Uh, in, in particular, citing, uh, I, I got cited there in front of the whole faculty senate as, as a, a badge of honor, <laughs> as a horrible, a horrible violator of, of speech because I wrote a blog post criticizing the uh, university's, uh, we're, we're starting a school of sustainability. And I wrote a blog post saying that looked like kind of empty posturing to me. And will the school of sustainability allow us to talk about nuclear power and, and carbon capture and storage? Uh, it seems like worthwhile questions, but I questioned the university's, quote, core value of sustainability and therefore should be censured and Hoover kicked off campus. Um, so in, in your and my uh, terms of it, he's, he's kind of historically been uh, a, a, a guy who wants censorship against speech he doesn't agree with. One of my favorite uh, tweets of his, he said, um, I'm fine with litmus tests. Here are a few of mine. If you're not anti-colonial, pro-decolonization, not anti-capitalist, pro-socialist, not anti-racist and anti-fascist, not anti-fossil fuel and pro-NGD, pro-feminist and pro-queer, bye. Well, that's an interesting point of view for somebody who's in charge of the uh, speech code report at Stanford. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. I think the administration may be giving him chance to vent. Uh, but our upper administration has been pretty darn good about free speech. The, the issue at, uh, so a group of faculty uh, wrote a uh, 
a petition saying, look, the answer to free to speech is just free speech. Adopt the Chicago principles, align yourself with this encouraging new movement towards academic freedom everywhere, and wash your hands of this stuff. And when somebody comes in whining about somebody's tweets, like I just did, and, and saying the university should censor him, which I just did not do, uh, the answer of the university is, you know, toughen up a little bit and so forth. In fact, the, the larger danger is, is the groups on campus who want free speech, but uh, you can have free speech, but it can't really make anybody feel unincluded and hurt somebody. You can have free speech, but you're not allowed to, to speak. You're not allowed to argue with the uh, university's DEI or climate change policies. That's what I, I, what I did is I disagreed with the university's climate change policies. You can have free speech so long as X, Y, and Z. And you know those I think are bureaucratically more dangerous. So we'll, we'll see what I, what I, what the good news here is there was a group of almost 200 Stanford faculty willing to publicly sign a, a letter saying we should have unfettered free speech, the Chicago principles, the Calvin report. And this is the big institutional good news. I think we've turned the corner on, on the Maoism, on the, the cultural revolution of the Wokies where everybody is scared to death to say anything against it. And lots of Good liberals. This is not a conservative liberal thing. Uh, lots of my liberal, very liberal colleagues, left wing colleagues. I, I know, I know communists <laughs> who are aghast at what's going on um, because they they value uh, freedom of speech. And the MIT fact in response to the Dorian Abbott affair, a bunch of MIT faculty did the same thing, and they were willing to publicly risk all the opprobrium that comes of, dis of, of saying, you know, Dorian Abbott should be allowed to speak on campus about, uh, about, um, about uh, the climate on foreign planets, even though he signed a Newsweek op-ed that was critical of DEI policies and wanted to see merit put in. Uh, Princeton had, uh, they, they invited him to speak. And so a bunch of, you know, uh, people did that. So uh, the, the pushback, the, the, ha the have you no decency, sir, moment uh, is, is slowly, yeah, now it's going to be a long and hard fight. Um, you know, Palumbalu will issue his report and many emails will be exchanged. And I, my poor provost and president are going to have to deal with all this squabbling around. But, but the forces of freedom are, are now willing to stand up and speak. Uh, Austin, people are willing to put their names on, on, I'm going to be an advisor to the university. Austin has, by the way, uh, a friend of mine said, how do I get a job here? And I, I asked Neil Ferguson about it. They have close to 3,000 applications for faculty positions already. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I um, bet. I bet. Uh, so there's a... There's a lot of people in academia who are sick to sick of this whole business. Uh, I have, you know, friends of mine. People are being told that they have to decolonize their readings in in, in econometric <laughs> classes. Uh, people have been told their grant applications have been turned down without scientific review because the DEI statement wasn't strong enough. Uh, people recognize that letting DEI bureaucrats. Uh, decide which applications you get to even see before you get to see them is not a way to run a university. Um, people are are standing up and courageously speaking out against this stuff. So I, I have hope that this tide is turning. There's a great Orwell quote. Uh, if liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. I think that uh, applies yeah, and they don't have to listen to you either, but um, it, you don't lose right. your job and get censured and kicked off a of campus because you dared to say, you know, school of sustainability, can I ask some questions about what that's going to mean? <laughs> yeah, it's just the, the right to, to ask questions and, and, and think what you want to think, which goes both ways. I mean, uh, and the fourth movement, I forgot to mention, the fourth movement is you can have free speech, but only if it's within your area of expertise, as determined by, of course, the faculty committee chaired by Professor Columbalu, who will decide what your area of expertise is. Uh, <laughs> free speech, guys, free speech, but is not free speech. That, that is very true. Um, I, I do have high hopes. I mean, I actually, by coincidence, heard the new president, uh, Pano Canellos of, of the University of Austin. I heard him speak a few days before it was announced. Jason Crawford, who was the, the second guest on this podcast, was hosting something in Austin and he was a speaker there. And I didn't know anything about it and I came away impressed. And he was the 
he, he was the president at St. John's College, which is one of the great books colleges where they meet and they make you read all of the, the great books, which is, uh, which is, which is a lot to read for a, a 18 to 22 year old. But I, I, I can assure you it's probably great training. And so I am optimistic about that. Well, I don't know. They, they have a lot. So breaking into the protected oligopoly of U.S. top U.S. universities is going to be very difficult. Uh, you know, the, the problem of nonprofit status, uh, these universities are getting an immense amount of taxpayer money uh, in order to, and to pursue a political goal that says we should get more taxpayer money. Uh, by being nonprofits, they're very, it's hard to compete against the nonprofit. Uh, I don't, how is the University of Texas, I mean, there are um, universities out there that don't do this kind of crazy stuff, but they're very, you know, there's Hillsdale and the GMU economics department, but they're not, they're not competing with Harvard and Yale yet. Um, if you take federal money, then you need a DEI bureaucracy. So how are they going to solve that problem? Uh, if, you know, if, if you, if you're, if you allow your students to get federal aid, then, you know, you have to follow all the dear colleague letters and title nine kangaroo courts and all the rest of it. Uh, so how are they going to, I don't know how they're going to square that circle and, and jump to excellence. Now the universities are the gatekeepers into the, uh, American elite. And that's why kid, people want to send their kids there. Um, so, uh, um, you know, jumpstarting that is good. Now it's not impossible. Um, and, and boodles of, you know, boodles of money is one of the answers. Um, the, you know, and there was a time when Harvard and Yale were everything and, and Rockefeller started the university of Chicago. It's possible to do. Uh, so I, I wish them great luck, but, but there's some, you know, it's not going to, it's, it's got some hard problems to solve. It, it, that makes me think of the, the funniest thing that I think Trump did personally was when I think it was Yale, they came out and they said that they gave this report that we're, they basically said, we're actually all just racist. And then they sued them. The, the justice department sued them. Said, oh, well, <laughs> okay. Well, if you say you're racist, then that's, um, I guess that uh, got dropped the minute Biden got elected, but I, I thought I would assume bad. so. I thought that was absolutely wonderful. Oh, 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 we, we didn't really mean we were, we were racist, racist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just the virtue signaling kind. Uh, but the university of Austin, the last thing I'll say there is that I do think the master stroke was putting it in Austin because it is a college town. It is a ton of fun. There are a probably at least a hundred thousand people that are age 18 to 24 that, you know, the, the social component I think is really huge. Whereas like a Hillsdale is in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Right. And you can still go to UT football games. You're still going to have the tailgates, the bars, all that stuff. And so you are, you're tapping into a pre-existing network of the social side, which to me is the hardest part about any of these colleges is that's, that's the part no one talks about. And it's clear um, universities, we move from bucolic small towns and people, with the resurgence of cities, everybody wanted to go to NYU, Columbia, you know, uh, they, uh, they wanted to be in, in cities. Now, of course, cities are falling apart. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, Rockefeller, uh, when he started uh, the University of Chicago, Chicago was an up and coming boom town. You also want to be where the new exciting um, economic opportunities are. And, uh, uh, you know, right now, <clears throat> bet on Austin, sadly, you know, uh, San Francisco and the, and the Bay Area seem intent on strangling um, both Stanford and the economics that uh, Stanford produces. Uh, so uh, Austin looks like a really good bet. Yeah, party town for the kids. Uh, and then the kids grow up and they stay there. They got jobs. Make, yeah. make, get jobs, create new companies, make a ton of money and give you donations. That's, that's where you want to put a university. Now, let, let, me, let me ask you about institutions at large to kind of wrap this all together here is the other post that you had was about how Tom Sowell has never won a Nobel prize. That's correct. Right. He's never won. Nope. And I'm blanking on his name here. Who's the guy from the New York times? Uh, the, the op-ed. Yeah. Krugman. He, he has one, right? Yes. Okay. So Krugman has a, a Nobel prize. Tom Sowell does not. I think even people who disagree with Tom Sowell, if they were just saying, you know, th this thing is supposed to be a measure of merit, would probably say that Tom Sowell is, is a better economist than, than Krugman. Now, that ties into all of these other institutions. So Stanford, talk about what's going on there. That's a, you know, 
as, as far as like forming and shaping people and measures of merit, and then take that all the way to the other side where it's, you know, you talk about like the Oscars, right? The Oscars are kind of a, a far extreme of the Nobel prize where it's like, it's no longer on merit, but it is an institution on how we celebrate the arts and culture and all that stuff. How do you think about everything from the university to the Nobel prize to the Oscars to everything in between and we talked about the media, the institutions of, of, of journalism and the specific institutions within it, everywhere, everywhere you want to go with this, how do you think about rebuilding versus building a new? Oh, <laughs> uh, institutions are slow to reform, especially once they get politicized. Uh, so uh, as a free market economist, I always think of competition. Uh, you know, the most important thing is, <clears throat> is competition and free entry. Uh, and uh, displacing old institutions with new institutions, or at least forcing them to. And you know, we've seen that over and over again. The U.S. car companies, uh, you know, the Japanese came in and cleaned their clocks, and the U.S. car companies responded by getting better. Uh, so this is a story over and over again. Uh, our institutions are getting ossified and politicized, and you know, there's less and less competition in building new institutions, um, in part because. You know, so much these days is about getting money from the federal government rather than by servicing a, 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 a clientele better. And that's harder to break into getting money from the federal government. Um, the Nobel thing is, uh, you know, I, uh, I, I wouldn't want to be in charge of that committee because they have a real hard job on their hands. And uh, I would not, cre- you know, what, they're, what they've been doing lately, you know, unlike the literature, <laughs> Uh, their preferences have squared exactly with the preferences of mainstream academic economists who work in economics departments and edit the American Economic Review and so forth. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, that who gets plaudits in the economics profession, who gets to be president of the American Economic Association, who gets the Bates Clark Medal for Best Economist under 40 and so forth. Uh, and that's largely people who publish in those journals. Uh, and and uh, you get plaudits internally for methodological contributions. And notice, you know, a lot of the Nobel Prizes have been about invented a new technique for doing X, Y, and Z. Okay, but what did they actually learn from that? Well, um, you know, I'm not criticizing the Nobel Committee because if you just ask around economics departments, they say, Who's the, who should we give the Nobel Prize to? And they say, well, the guy who invented the technique for doing X, Y, and Z. <laughs> Economists love methodology as opposed to actually learning about uh, something. So it's, you know, Nobel people have been very conventional about that. If you want to criticize, it's why is the economics professions as a whole drifting left fast? Uh, You know, just look at the American Economic Association website for the amount of outrageous political instruction on that website on how on, on both matters of race and economic policy. Uh, and, and, and of course, you know, anyway, my blog has some quotes if you want to go look it up. So the, the profession has drifted to the political left and, and has always been interested in methodological as opposed to substantive contributions. The, the latest Nobel Prize was interesting because they cited a paper that has been replicated and found to be wrong. <laughs> Uh, but the methodology was great. <laughs> and you know, lots and lots of people wrote lots and lots of papers using the methodology. You know, Tom Sowell has, uh, to my mind, um, come up with more enormous insights about things that are important to American society right now. Like, you know, where is there racism and where isn't there racism? There's plenty of racism, you know, since it's in the public schools. <laughs> but where is there not racism? You know, he he's has some really well-documented fact, but he didn't invent the new way to run a regression or he didn't invent the new mathematical model. And that in, if you go around faculty lunchrooms and say who ought to get the Nobel prize, you know, no one's going to say Tom Sowell because he, he just actually taught us some facts about the world as opposed to a new regression. So I, you know, don't, don't fault the Nobel committee. They're, they're doing the best they can fault the economics profession as a whole for being quite so methodological and, and inward looking as opposed to um, and, and the economics profession is more and more worrying about the real world, but they're, they're doing it more and more to get the right political answer. Um, you know, there's, there's plenty of stuff in the journals that, that bears on policy, but it doesn't do so in a scientific, critical way. In fact, it's getting, it's getting harder and harder to publish the, quote, wrong answers. Uh-huh. If you have a paper on climate economics that comes out and says, hey, this isn't a problem, good luck getting it published. Good luck in getting a grant. Uh, certainly good luck getting, uh, you know, any, any position of prominence in, in the journals. So it's not that they're not interested in public policy. It's just not, not doing it in a very serious way. 
I think uh, I, I think we got to get you out of here. We've been going for 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 a while, and uh, last time, you know, we we could have kept going, and and so we said we would this time. But um, it's always a pleasure to have you on. There's so there's so much that had that had happened between July and and now that recording in in mid November. I assume that that next time there will be a lot to go on as well. Yep. And, uh, you know, if, if you want lunacy out of Washington to talk about, there's, there's a steady supply. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. They make it easy for us. Democracy is for the amusement of the electorate uh, and, and provision of uh, material for, for stand-up comedians. We're, we're going to be well served. That's a good forecast. Yeah. Maybe we'll do a, a comedy podcast next time, but uh, all right. Thanks, John. Appreciate Thanks, it. John.